Thank you. Thank Please you, Walter. Speak. Also wanted to thank uh, Irina. I, I don't see her right now. She's in the back. Uh, she sent me off to the US uh, 33 years ago. And I was only going to stay for one year, and, and I'm still there. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, what I wanted to discuss is um, accelerators for society. Uh, Walter gave me that uh, title as well. And what I'm showing you here is a, a famous first picture from um, Widrow's machine, first linear accelerator. And this eventually turns out to be a tool for particle physics. And now, in these two modern versions, the LCLS and LCLS2, a big LINAC that drives a, a free electron laser, at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, as well as at the DAISY uh, European XFEL machines, they're driving new science in chemistry, material science, and other applications. Uh, Lawrence was inspired by the work of Witherow. There is a famous letter in the uh, Berkeley Library that talks about how he uh, looked at uh, Witherow's paper and he writes, I don't understand German, but I can figure out from the drawing how to do it better. And he turns the particles around in a, in a little cyclotron. So the cyclotron, of course, grew from a handheld device to all of the modern synchrotron-based light sources. And then, of course, the flagship of particle physics at um, uh, CERN, which we're essentially celebrating today. Um, I will, after giving a few of these examples of how these machines that have driven the forefront in science have then spun off applications in, um, in other areas, and then I will talk, take a detour into explaining to you a new technique for particle acceleration that I've been working on myself for a number of decades, uh, and ask the question, what applications could this possibly bring to society? So, in doing a little bit of research, I ran across this paper here, uh, which talks about 10 reasons why you can't live without a particle accelerator, and especially this byline is pretty interesting. Particle accelerators can make you healthy and wealthy. So, you, we all need one. Uh, they're used for irradiation of, of uh, all sorts of things to sterilize them, uh, for sterilizing food here, uh, producing radioisotopes, um, purifying water, etc. But this, this paper here gives you sort of 10 different applications. It, back in 2009, uh, this was uh, right after Obama came to power. There was an, an, a new drive to um, invigorate science in, in the US, and especially accelerator-based science. And there was a workshop held called Accelerators for America's Future. Uh, that talks about all of the different types of accelerators and then also what are the applications that can be um, promoted by pushing accelerator technology. Uh, of course, um, medical applications, um, uh, manufacturing applications, etc. cetera. Uh, Maury Tigner gave a talk at this uh, workshop and he called accelerators as the modern ships of discovery. And so it's not just for for science, but also for all of the um, society applic societal applications. Uh, following this workshop here in 2009, there were a series of more workshops, two of them in 2013, uh, one that I organized on a workshop on laser technology for accelerators, and then one for medical applications of accelerators. And then in 2015, there was a workshop on energy and environmental applications uh, of accelerators. So these are really sort of the, the more the conventional accelerators. Uh, and we've already seen a number of applications uh, this morning in, in all of the wonderful talks. Uh, ion implantation is an important um, uh, application of accelerators. Isotope production, uh, neutron generators for material inspection, and then, of course, all the medical use. And you heard, uh, even in the previous talk, all of the spin-offs coming out of CERN that helped the development of uh, medical technology. Yves Jongen from IBA, so there's another connection here uh, with Belgium, uh, gave a talk on electron beam and X-ray industrial applications, and he talked about sterilization, E-beam induced chemistry, our tires that we drive on with our cars are all produced with uh, um, polymerization triggered by uh, particle accelerators, um, artificially coloring of gemstones is done with electron beams in, in, um, to induce crystal defects. 
And then electron beams are also used for looking at treatment of gas coming out of, of uh, chimneys in big factories. Also for treating um, uh, effluent from uh, water purification plants. Ion beams are used for medical applications, obviously microfiltration systems, drilling tiny little holes in materials. And then one very fascinating application, cleaving of silicon wafers. Normally, silicon comes out of a big bowl, they slice it up, you lose a lot of material. By using ion beams, you deposit an ion beam right at the so-called Bragg peak, and that bubbles up basically a piece of the silicon wafer, and you do cleaving of silicon wafers without any loss of material. So this is another application. I think Jorgen showed the plot earlier with the number of accelerators. I think it was Jorgen. Uh, this is a, a sort of a similar plot of all of the applications of uh, industrial medical and research accelerators grouped by, in here the blue is the um, in industrial, medical, and then the research accelerators. And you can see this is, has a, a large quantity of accelerators are out there, about 40,000. The market itself of selling accelerators is about $2 billion a year. And the products that these accelerators create are roughly of the order of half a trillion dollars per year. So the impact is, is really very significant. But the question that I wanted to look at in the next section of my talk is if you think about computers. This is a computer from 1954, one of the most powerful machines at the time. And now we're all walking around with devices that are much more powerful. So can something similar be done with particle accelerators? And can that open up new applications that are of benefit to society? And that's sort of the question that I want to look at uh, today. So basically, what, what can we do and can new ap applications be enabled? So if we go back in history, it took about 80 years to go from a handheld device and Freddie impressed us all with the Airbus 380 flying at 700 kilometers per hour to look at what stored energy there is in the LHC. The size went up 100,000 times and the energy went up about a billion times. So this is incredibly challenging for any new technology to reach a level like this. The bar is incredibly high. And that's, of course, one of the, of the, the key things that new technology will ultimately have to show. When Fabiola became director of CERN, she gave an interview, and there was an important question asked. Some people think that future governments will be unwilling to fund larger and more expensive facilities. Do you think a collider bigger than the LHC will ever be built, and will it depend on the LHC finding something new? So I liked her answer a lot, and my, I highlighted the part that I really liked. She says, what we have to do is push the research and development in accelerator technology so that we will be able to reach higher energy with compact accelerators. CERN embarked on development of advanced accelerators with the AWAKE project, which is a proton-driven version of what I will talk about. The stuff that I will talk about is mainly laser-driven. So this is really important, I think. And when you start thinking about building a collider, that's, of course, a, an, an incredible task ahead, uh, you, you probably have seen this, you could go to IKEA and buy the Hadron Collider there, but it turns out they ran out of, of these parts here, so you have to come up with a new, really new concept. Turns out that concept was actually proposed almo almost 40 years ago. And this is a seminal paper by Toshi Tajima and John Dawson. These were two, uh, he was a po Toshi was a postdoc at UCLA, and John Dawson was a professor at UCLA, and this is part of the reason why I went to UCLA upon Irina's recommendation. They looked at what happens if you send an intense laser pulse through an ionized medium. What could that do? It turns out that when you send an intense laser pulse or electron beam or proton beam, as is now shown, you can excite fields by the photon pressure of this laser pulse inside this medium, which consists of electrons and ions flowing around each other, that are so large that they can accelerate particles in centimeters up to energies of GVs, and I will show you that. 
So what happens is these, these photons push electrons out of the way, much like a motorboat pushes water out of the way. And if you look at what a motorboat does, it displaces water and it generates this wave. And this wave here is tied to the motorboat. So if you fall asleep during my talk, just think about surfing on these waves. And that's, what I'm, that's the type of physics we actually do. It had, to, it had to come out of California to think of this. But it's surfing wakes behind motorboats. So you generate these large fields here by blowing out electrons, leaving ions unshielded, so you have positive charge, then negative charge here, positive charge, negative charge, etc. And so you have this wake structure left behind by the, this laser beam. We had done experiments in the early days at UCLA. This is a paper from 1993. And it, I wanted to show you this because it sort of gives you the status that we were at 25 years ago. We actually had to build a, a little cloud chamber to look at the electrons that we accelerated. And for particle physicists, this was ridiculous that we went back to this. But we were counting individual electrons that were accelerated by the laser. The laser technology that we used at the time was a CO2 laser system. Now, that all changed by this paper here. And this year, we were celebrating the Nobel Prize in Physics for this work. Donna Strickland and Girard Mourou wrote, this is probably one of the shortest abstracts one could imagine and still get you a Nobel Prize. It's only two lines. But it talks about compression of amplified chirp chirped optical pulses. So the idea that Girard and Donna proposed was to take a short pulse, stretch it out in time, amplify it, and then recompress it. Why do you do this? Because if you amplify a short pulse through medium, pretty soon you will reach power levels and intensities that actually destroys the medium that you're trying to use for amplification of the pulses. So you have to stretch your pulses. And then at the very end, much like you pull out an accordion, pump it full of energy, you push the accordion back together, you generate a giant laser pulse. And that really led to a revolution in the use of lasers. So it's shown here. So you start with your short pulse, stretch it, amplify it, recompress it. We do this nowadays with 12 orders of magnitude difference in initial energy of this little pulse compared to the final energy in the, in the main pulse. This, in addition, led to a revolution in the type, type of physics you can do with these systems. What I'm showing you here is the focus intensity versus years. This is when chirp pulse amplification was invented. And you see the rapid rise. Girard and, and, and Toshi wrote this, this paper, and we're not following this line. We've, we've tapered off quite a while before that. But it opened up thinking about compact accelerators, ultra-high harmonic generation, free electron lasers, sort of the ultra source. Everything comes out of this when this laser interacts with this plasma. Radiation comes out, particles comes out. There's a lot of interesting physics. And it even ties into particle physics through some nonlinear QED experiments that you could do with all of this. So in the simplest incarnation of this accelerator, you actually take one of these chirp pulse amplification lasers, you focus it onto a gas jet, the laser pulse ionizes the gas jet, produces this sea of electrons and, and, and ions. Laser pulse comes in, snow plows the electrons out of the way. You set up this space charge field that propagates roughly with the speed of light behind that laser pulse. You're generating fields on the order of 100 gigavolt per meter. Conventional accelerators run at 10 to 40 megavolt per meter. In the early days, this is what we got. This is the number of electrons versus energy and again, our particle physics friends were not impressed with this at all. This was more of sort of a spray of electrons coming out of the plasma rather than a well-defined beam. But for us in the field, this demonstrated that in a few millimeters, we reached some of electrons up to 50 MeV. So that wasn't enough. This is not how you do applications. So being at Berkeley Lab, being embedded in a, in a particle physics or an accelerator, historic accelerator laboratory, made me think more about how do you build these devices, laser-driven plasma-based accelerators, from the perspective of how you build convention accelerators. A convention accelerator would have an injector, a copper structure, could be superconducting, could be normal conducting, an RF power source, the 
copper structure confines the RF power and, and shapes the fields in such a way that you can accelerate particles with it. And after, when you do everything right, you, you will get your high energy electron beam. Similarly, what we do here is you have some form of electron injection. Instead of RF, you use a drive laser. And instead of a copper structure to confine the RF power, you use a plasma structure and you shape the plasma in the right way to confine the laser beam over an extended distance. In essence, you're building a fiber optic for these ultra high intensity laser pulses. What do I mean by ultra high intensity? 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. You cannot use optical fibers for this because they would get damaged right away. So how do you get these electrons? Let's go back to the picture of surfers. When you look at a, a wave on the ocean, the water actually just moves up and down in the right phasing so that, that, that this wave rolls towards you. The only water that's really moving forward is this white foam here. We call that self-injection of electrons. What you really want is all of these guys surfing nicely together. This, if you manage to do this in an accelerator, will give you small energy spread because all of the surfers arrive with the same speed. And if you don't do it right, you end up like this guy who is injected out of phase. And you don't want that. That's a messy, messy thing when that happens. In our structures, I'm zooming now into one of these little cavities that we produce. This is the laser beam. It propagates this direction. It snow plows electrons. The black zone is where there's no electrons left, only ions. And the electrons are sort of streaming here. And these guys here that made this turn, these are the injected electrons. So it's electrons that you pull out of the plasma at the back of the bubble, and they are accelerating. Notice this little wiggle. This is not an artifact of some simulation. This is real. And it comes because an electron gets um, trapped off axis and then wiggles. This will be important for applications that I will touch upon. This, for scale, is something of the order 15 micron, or maybe 50 micron. That's what we're talking about. The other key ingredient to build this accelerator was this copper structure. And what we've developed at Berkeley is essentially this optical fiber method, relying on shaping of plasmas in such a way that instead of a laser beam that you focus at the entrance, diffracts out rapidly, it stays guided over extended distances. And then we've learned that this trapping, this white water, if you do things right, you can have these surfing electrons all reach the same energy if you terminate the accelerator at, at the right moment. And this is exactly what we did back in 2004. We got the cover of Nature for this work. For the first time, my group at Berkeley, a group at U in the UK and a group in France, showed generation of narrow energy spread beams, 100 MeV, out of a couple millimeter long accelerator. So this gave a big boost to our field, because now all of a sudden we start producing real beams. A few years later, we had a bigger laser. This was done with a 10 terawatt laser. If you remember the numbers that were talked about before, Freddie talked about three, four, some, some think it's 10 terawatt is a global production of, of electricity. We produced this in a shing, single shot in our laser pulses back in 2004. Here it's 40 terawatt. And we use now a capillary discharge, which is basically a little lightning bolt inside sapphire plates that also allows you to guide uh, the um, uh, laser beam. And with this 40 terawatt beam, we generated one GV electron beam from a device that's about this long just three centimeters long. Scaling of energy is like this. This is the plasma density, and this is the scaling of the energy that we were measuring up to about 2010. So the lower the plasma density, the higher the speed of the particle that you can get. And you can understand this by the speed of the um, uh, motorboat, essentially. If the plasma is very dense, this motorboat will travel slowly because it's going through a thick medium, if you wish. If the plasma becomes very tenuous, the, uh, the motorboat can travel very fast and the electrons can serve for a long time. So the question now was, okay, how do we get to 10 GeV? 
So we proposed this right at, the, at, um, at 2009. Again, Obama came to power. We submitted a proposal to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to generate a 10 GV module as part of this uh, stimulus that Obama launched. And we got the money. And our idea was, could we build a collider by daisy chaining 10 GV modules, each maybe half a meter long, generate a TV beam of electrons, do the same on the positron side, TV beam from positrons, and collide the two. It all seems very straightforward, but of course that takes a lot of work. And again, as, as I think both Jorgen and Freddie showed you, time scale for our technology also is measured in decades. This is all documented in a report uh, from the Department of Energy how we want to do this. So we got the money, and we actually had to buy a French laser to do it. This is a laser built by Thales. It was the world's first commercial 1 hertz repetition rate petawatt system. So petawatt is 10 to the 15 watt, 1,000 terawatt peak power. And Freddie reminded me on our walk over, you're talking about your accelerator being only this big, but you have a room full of lasers. But I'll put it to scale for you later on, Freddie. So this is indeed a large laser system. This is the type of structures we use. So these are capillary discharge structures, two electrodes, you fill it with gas, you fire the discharge, and it turns out through hydrodynamic pressure that it forms a parabolic profile in the density which guides your laser beam. And this really works. So in, two, in, in 2014, we published a paper in Physical Review Letters that for the first time, from a 9 centimeter structure, we were able to do 4.25 GeV. So now you're talking about a structure this big to reach an energy that with conventional Linux would take you quite a distance to do it. And this be became quite a, um, a stir in the, in the world. We were very excited about this. But we decided, well, that's not enough, because we're only using one-third of the Bella peak power. Between 2014 and 2018, we had to figure out how do we make the capillaries survive the full petawatt. We've now managed to crack this, and I'm very happy to, to report to you that now from a 20-centimeter structure, we've been able to generate 8 GV electron beams. And this is getting submitted uh, next week, or maybe um, it was submitted today. But this was basically a structure where we put a full petawatt laser beam through to generate electron beams of 8 GV, and it nicely guided the laser beam. This is the mode at the entrance. This is without the structure. This is the mode 20 centimeter when you fire the capillary correctly. This is the size of the mode if you wouldn't have that optical fiber to confine this, this power. So clearly, we're marching nicely on this curve, and I hope soon that we will actually do the 10 GV. So let me bring it back to applications. This is the evolution of what happened with Lawrence's cyclotron, from a handheld device to the largest one, and then relativity took over, and he couldn't go bigger. He had to switch, they had to switch to synchrotrons. We're sort of undergoing a similar evolution. Three centimeter in 2006 got us to a GV. Nine centimeter got us to four GV. 20 centimeter got us to six to eight GV. So to put it into perspective, if I want to build a similar accelerator with 10 GV, Freddie, this is for you, this slide. This is what it would take. With our technology, this is our laser system, this is our target chamber, that's the accelerator. And if I put the lab on the same scale as a soccer field, that's what it would look like. Okay? So it's still a big advantage. I'm cheating a little bit because your LINAC is not that wide, but it's certainly that long. So, can we now use this new technology to look at new applications? So what I'm showing you here is beam energy and beam power. For 
Jean, your, your requirements are way out there. I don't even, I, I leave that up to Freddy to, to satisfy your needs, but that's over here and beyond. So this is very, very challenging for our technology. We do believe that there is a path, but it will take several decades. Light sources, the big X, X fells, there's only few in the world. What if we could build an XFEL of a scale that fits at a university or a small industry? Can we do something for medicine? Can we do something for security? Can we do something for industry? So the idea behind these compact accelerators is bring the machine to the problem. When you think of all of the classical accelerators, the problem has to come to the machine because the machines are large. So can we reverse that paradigm and build accelerators that are small enough that the accelerator could go to the user wherever that is? So you have the colliders. We are working as a community, and this is a worldwide effort, on verifying are the beam properties of these devices good enough that they could drive a free electron laser. Can we build compact MEV Thomson gamma ray sources. This is used for inspection of cargo, for example, and they're using Bremsstrahlung sources right now. What if you take a compact accelerator, collide it with a laser, generate an intense gamma ray beam that's very well directed and very monochromatic in comparison to a Bremsstrahlung source, and do cargo scanning with this? This is an image similar to that high-resolution X-ray image that Sigi showed earlier. But this is done not with a synchrotron source, but with X-rays emitted by a compact laser plasma accelerator from these little wiggling electrons. If you remember that little wiggling electron, that's essentially an electron beam inside an undulator. And it emits for free hard X-rays. And so folks are now starting to use it for phase contrast imaging. And they don't have to go to a synchrotron because you can do it on a tabletop. And then one that's near and dear to my heart, and that I'll spend one slide on, is can we make the accelerator so small that it could actually enter the human body and do radiation treatment right next to the tumor instead of coming from external irradiation? So there is a European effort called Excellence in Applications for these devices. And they're looking at very, very similar applications. This is Eupraxia global effort uh, led by a group at DAISY, understanding fundamental laws, producing x-rays for inspection, irradiating and destroying tumor cells, producing light and filming of molecular movies. These are sort of the core applications, and you could say, well, these are still in the, the scientific realm with all of the spin-offs when you do this, but these are clearly in the industry and medicine realm. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes on this idea of make the accelerator so small that it can enter the body. So if it happens that you're unfortunate and have prostate cancer, if you have prostate cancer, the, one of the treatments is to implant iridium seeds near the prostate, and they irradiate, and they irradiate 4 pi. So what I'm showing you here is uh, an physicist sketch of what the anatomical parts look like in your body, so your, uh, your bladder, um, urethra, etc. And if you do this implant of iridium-192, you radiate everywhere. And of course, they tailor the dose in such a way that the tumor gets most of the dose, but still you're doing damage to everything else. So imagine that you could bring, instead of this radioactive source, this tiny little accelerator right next to the tumor. The coloring of those from a 2 MeV electron beam that would be delivered right there is identical. So you're localizing the dose much, much more. And this is basically the curve that tells you where the dose will be deposited. This is dose versus depth. Ions are, of course, favorite because of their property to deposit most energy at a very specific depth. X-rays and electrons, electrons especially, have a very short range, so that's why you want to bring the accelerator to the tumor. So we've been working on a concept on this, what we call a minimally invasive fiber-based electron plasma, laser plasma accelerator. 
is essentially a brachytherapy source that's powered by a small commercial laser, a special hollow core fiber system that serves the purpose of generating broader colors of your laser light. Think back about this chirp pulse amplification. When you do the stretching, amplification, and recompression, recompression, you need enough bandwidth in your light because otherwise Heisenberg will tell you you cannot compress that beyond what its spectral bandwidth allows you to do. We typically run, out of these lasers, 40 nanometer, 30 femtosecond pulses. Imagine you triple or quadruple the bandwidth down to, let's say, 150 nanometer here, then you're able to generate just a few cycle optical pulses. If you have a few cycle optical pulse, that's a few femtoseconds, even if you only have a few millijoule, it's a terawatt. It's a terawatt coming out of the tip of an optical fiber, where you then put a very specialized little gas cell to generate your electron beam. And this sounds really science fiction, but there's a lot of progress being made in all of this here. And we're doing this together with medical companies, other industry here in Europe, and then Cancer Center at the University of California, San Francisco, because one of the big questions on these applications is, when you think about radiation with today's machines, the radiation bursts are long. All of the communication mechanisms between all of the cancer cells and the healthy cells are occurring on a time scale that's actually shorter than the delivery of the dose. So what if you could deliver the dose to a tumor on a scale that is fast compared to the response time of these, these biological systems. It turns out that there might be significant dif um, differences and benefits to it. So, in the last minutes here, I wanted to say one more thing. All of these applications that I told you about, even our Bella Perawatt laser, is one shot per second. The particle physicist in this room run with luminosities that require us to fire 10,000 times per second or more. So how do we do this? And I gave this, this talk or this idea a number of years ago when Bert Richter was still alive. And he said, you, were, you are in exactly the same location with your technology as we were in 1960 when the Slack Linac was getting built. There was no RF power sources capable of powering their RF Linac they had to work together with industry to develop that technology of these very powerful klystrons to drive their, their systems. So we're sort of in the same realm here. This is getting attention, and there was a National Academy study that just came out on opportunities in intense ultrafast lasers. These are two DOE reports, and then another workshop uh, that I or organized at Berkeley to look at laser technology for what we call K-Bella, kilohertz bella and beyond, how do we build lasers that will supply enough power to the targets to enable particle physics? So we held this workshop, and it turns out that there's multiple groups that have ideas on how to do this. I'm not going to go into detail. And you could look at some of these ideas for the first stage of your collider and then for all of the subsequent modules here. But the key message is, Ten years ago, if you would have said, I need a 10 kilowatt ultra-fast laser, you would either be laughed out of the room or, or told, this is just not possible. And now these things are being built. So this is very exciting. So I wanted to leave with a quote, because I've, a few of the previous speakers did the same thing. And this time I'm ending with the same picture here from Lawrence. I apologize, you're now at 700 megajoule. This was, I made this earlier. But I'm going to leave you with George Bernard Shaw's quote, which says, people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. Thank you so much.